in the previous chapter, we talked about the hypothesis test for equality of three or more population proportions. In this chapter, as you may imagine, we are going to discuss the hypothesis tests for equality of three or more population means, and this is also called analysis of variance. Let's look at our introductory example. Chemitech developed a new filtration system for municipal water suppliers. The components for the new filtration system will be purchased from several suppliers, and Chemitech will assemble the components at its Columbia, South Carolina plant. The industrial engineering group is responsible for determining the best assembly method for the new filtration system. After considering a variety of possible approaches, the group narrows the alternative to three, method A, B, and C. These methods differ in the sequence of steps used to assemble the system. Managers want to determine which assembly method can produce the greatest number of filtration systems per week. Here, assembly method is the independent variable, also called factor. The three assembly methods that correspond to this factor are called three treatment. The Chemitech problem is an example of single factor experiment involving one qualitative factor method of assembly. As a result, this is also called one-way ANOVA. The three assembly methods or treatments define the three populations. One population is all employees who use method A, another is those who use method B, and the last and third one is those who use method C. For each population, the dependent or response variable is the number of filtration systems assembled per week. The primary objective is to determine whether the mean number of units produced per week is the same for all three populations or methods. Essentially, we are comparing and testing three population means in this case and see whether indeed they are equal. Suppose that 15 workers are randomly selected and assigned to each of the three methods equally, five workers per method or treatment. And the table below summarizes the data. For example, let's take a look at five workers assigned to method A or treatment A. They produce 58 units, 64 units, 55 units, 66 units, and 67 units per week, respectively. Once we get the data, it's easy to compute sample mean, sample variance, and sample standard deviation. Later on, we're going to repeat this calculation in IPython notebook. Following convention, we are going to define the three population means as mu1, mu2, and mu3. The null hypothesis is thus mu1 is equal to mu2 is equal to mu3, and the alternative hypothesis is not all population means are equal. And ANOVA is the statistical procedure used to determine whether the observed differences in the three sample means are large enough to reject H0. Here are some key assumptions for ANOVA analysis. First of all, for each population, the response variable is normally distributed. In our Chemitech example, the number of units produced per week must be normally distributed for each assembly method. Second, the variance of the response variable sigma is the same for all the populations. In our example, the variance of the number of units produced per week must be the same for each assembly method. And third, the observations must be independent. In our example, the number of units produced per week for each employee must be independent of the number of units produced per week 
for any other employees. The Chemitech example is an example of completely randomized experiment design. In general, if the variability among the sample means is pretty small, it supports the null hypothesis. Alternatively, if the variability among the sample means is large, it supports the alternative hypothesis. And here you see the hypothesis for general ANOVA analysis, and that is the test for the equality of k population means. Let's take a look at some of the notations. Here I'm going to emphasize the subscripts i and j. Here j indicates the uh, jth population. Note that each population is associated with each treatment. The jth population is indeed the jth treatment as well. And i is associated with observation i. So here xij is the value of observation i for treatment j. The way we compute the sample mean and sample variance is identical to the way we compute them when we are comparing two population means. In this case, we have to consider both the different observations and the different treatment. As a result, we have something called overall sample mean, which is often called grand mean. The way to compute that is also pretty straightforward. It is simply the average of all the sampling results. To conduct ANOVA analysis, we need MSTR, which is mean square due to treatment. MSTR is equal to SSTR divided by the degree of freedom. And SSTR is the sum of square due to treatment. Actually, it means the sum of squared errors due to treatments or between treatments. And this is the formula with which we can compute SSTR. Another thing we need in ANOVA analysis is mean squared error, MSE, which is equal to SSE divided by its degree of freedom. SSE is sum of squares due to error. To be more exact, it is sum of squared errors due to the variation within each treatment. Once we have MSTR and MSE, it is very easy to compute the F-test statistic. In F-distribution, we have two degrees of freedom, one for the numerator and the other for the denominator. The degree of freedom for numerator is equal to k minus 1, and k is the number of treatments for the factor. And the degree of freedom for the denominator is m minus k and is our total sample size. Once we have the f-test statistic, it is easy to draw the conclusion. We can either use the p-value approach or the critical value approach. Once again, this f-test is going to be a upper-tailed test. When the null hypothesis is true, mean squares due to treatment will be relatively small. On the other hand, mean squared error within treatment will be relatively large. As a result, f value will be relatively small. So that's why this is always going to be an upper tailed test. This is something you are going to see many, many, many times in the future. This is called ANOVA table. ANOVA table summarizes all the key information of ANOVA analysis. Next, we are going to turn to our IPython notebook and conduct all the calculations based on our Chemitech example. In the end, we will print out a result for our Chemitech example similar to this ANOVA table over here. All right, let's start the fun. First of all, I import F distribution from SciPy stats package. I'm also importing the NumPy package, and we're gonna keep all those data in a NumPy array. Here, we have all the original data from our experiment. And those five numbers are the number of units produced by five workers assigned to method A, and so on and so forth. Using 
this list comprehension, we can find the sample size. In this case, we get the sample size for each of the three treatments, as we already know that in a total of 15 workers, five of them assigned to each of the three treatments. As a result, the sample size for each treatment is 5, 5, and 5. And not surprisingly, the total sample size is 15. K is the number of treatment for this factor under study. In our case, there are three methods or three treatment. With number array, it's very easy to find the overall sample mean, which is 60 in our case. And similarly, we can find the sample mean for each treatment. We achieve that by calling the mean method for number array with axis being 1. In some sense, axis being 1 means that we are taking the average for rows. Recall that in our data set, each row of data represents each treatment. As a result, the three sample means are 62, 66, and 52. Similarly, we can compute the standard deviation for each of the three treatments. Let's introduce Python zip function briefly. It will come in handy next. Basically, this zip function turns two lists of equal length into one list of tuples. In each tuple, it has two values. One comes from the first list, and the other comes from the other list. Now let's compute SSTR, which is the sum of squares due to or between treatment. While computing SSTR, we can safely ignore the variations within treatment. That is to say, it is as if each member were replaced with the sample mean of its treatment or group, and we use list comprehension to do the job. For each sample mean, we are going to subtract grand mean from it, and then square it, and then multiply it by its corresponding sample size. And we do the same thing for each of the three sample means. And then we sum it up, we get our SSTR. Degree of freedom is pretty straightforward, it's equal to k minus 1. Once we have that, we can find out about MSTR, which is the ratio of SSTR and the degree of freedom. In our case, SSTR is 520, degree of freedom for treatment is 2, as a result, MSTR is 260. Next, we are going to compute SSE, the sum of squares due to error within treatment. And this time around, we are going to zip the list of sample size and the list of sample standard deviations. The degree of freedom is m minus k, so the MSE is equal to SSE divided by the degree of freedom. In our example, SSE is 340, and the MSE is 28.33. Next, let's calculate SST, the sum of squared total variation. Essentially, SST is the total variation of each data point around the grand mean. Think of it this way. SST is nothing but the numerator in calculating the sample variance. As a result, SST is equal to the degree of freedom and minus 1 times the sample variance, which is given by this method. In our case, SST is equal to 860. And here, I'd like to introduce to you a very important concept. In ANOVA analysis, we always have the following. SST is equal to the sum of SSTR and SSE. You see, over here, we calculated SST with two different approaches. One is from its original definition, as you can see over here. The other is the sum of SSTR and SSE. Not surprisingly, they are equal to A60. Basically, the total variation around grand mean can be decomposed into two components. 
One is the variation resulted from different treatment. The other is the variance within each treatment. In some sense, you can think of SSE as some kind of white noise. Now let's conduct our F-test. F-test statistic is easy to compute, which is equal to MSTR divided by MSE. Once again, let's assume R is 5%, so we can find out about the critical value. Remember that we need to assign two degrees of freedom, one for the numerator, the other for the denominator. Because it's upper tail test, uh, we can compute p-value just like this. In the end, let's take a look at the final results. The critical f-value is equal to 3.885. I printed out the result in a format similar to the ANOVA table we saw at the last page of our PowerPoint slides. Here, SSTR is 520, the degree of freedom is 2, as a result, MSTR is 260. The F-test statistic is equal to 9.17. And here, we can draw our conclusion already, because we know F-test statistic is greater than the critical value, as a result, we are going to reject the null hypothesis. The corresponding p-value is less than 1%, so even if the significance level alpha is 1%, we can still reject the null hypothesis. In the next row, we see that SSE is equal to 340, its degree of freedom is 12, as a result, MSE is 28.33, and in the end, SST sum of squares due to total variation is 860, and its degree of freedom is 14, which is equal to the total sample size 15 minus 1. So, in the end, we can conclude that the three population means are indeed different. That is to say, the different methods or the different treatments do make a difference in the number of units a worker can produce in one week.